uh, it's really an honor to, uh, to be um, the first um, uh, right after the opening. And it's afternoon time, uh, lunch hour in Hong Kong. Uh, I've seen there are Hong Kong viewers uh, from our Facebook page joining the live. So I would also like to say uh, welcome, uh, Hong Kongers. Uh, wonderful uh, to see you uh, joining this unprecedented uh, initiative with the Together We Remember Coalition um, and the Hong Kong Holocaust and Torrance Center. I guess we're all set, David. Yep, we're all set. Yeah. We'll start with our musical invocation. Uh, so let me go ahead and get that queued up for us. Tell us a little bit more about what we were just listening to. Sure. Um, this was uh, uh, um, uh, with Hong Kong um, uh, Chinese uh, uh, youths uh, who played a piece of um, Holocaust music, uh, which uh, which we um, used um, to start with the United Nations Holocaust Memorial Day uh, commemoration um, in Hong Kong uh, earlier this year, uh, before the outbreak of the um, COVID-19. So uh, this is one of the... Uh, uh, music, we, uh, music is powerful. So uh, when, I, when, when I first um, got the invitation from you saying that, hmm, besides poem reading, uh, how about using some music, uh, survivor stories uh, to start the commemoration, uh, this piece um, immediately came to my mind. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And to our viewers, 
Uh, you're probably seeing a little bit of a lag on the video. It's the best we can do with the, the Zoom gods, um, but definitely <laughs> within, with intent, the audio will come through clearly. Hopefully the, the visual is also um, coming through pretty clearly as, as well. Um, but in the meantime, Simon, I'm gonna go ahead and queue up some of your first slides. Um, so let's sure. do that. And uh, in meantime, I would just like to say uh, hello once again uh, to our viewers. Um, good evening to Americas. Uh, good afternoon to Asia. Uh, Hong Kong is now just right after 1 p.m. and Oceania. Uh, good morning to uh, Africa and Europe. Uh, very warm welcome from the Hong Kong Holocaust and Torrent Center. Whichever time it is uh, when you're joining our special live uh, from Asia, uh, welcome. Uh, we are delighted and honored to participate in this 24-hour virtual global vigil for Genocide Awareness Month. Global solidarity is now um, more important than ever in this uniquely challenging time. Uh, as we begin, uh, we send our wishes uh, and hopes to all who are affected by COVID-19 um, around the world. Uh, as you know, uh, Hong Kong has been uh, impacted uh, also a lot um, uh, since earlier this year. Uh, HKHTC, um, the name of the acronym of our center, Hong Kong Holocaust and Tolerance Center, uh, is a nonprofit entity uh, founded in 2011 to advance education and awareness of the Holocaust and also genocides around Asia, as well as promote um, the ideal of tolerance. So I just thought uh, in the beginning, um, uh, you might be interested to know more a little bit about uh, this Holocaust Center uh, in Hong Kong uh, and in, in fact in East Asia. Uh, we are one of the uh, uh, um, very active organizations uh, which does educational work to promote tolerance. Um, there's a huge demand for Holocaust and tolerance education in Asia. Um, countries throughout the region um, have suffered mass violence and genocide in the past and Holocaust education uh, is a way to raise awareness about the origins of conflict and discrimination, as well as to explore the long lasting shadows genocide cast over societies. I'm now in Asia and Holocaust education matters in Asia, in our region, because relatively few people know much about it. And more than 60% of the world's population now lives in Asia. And it is imperative to provide access to accurate, um, informative, and reflective information about the Holocaust and to counter uh, widespread uh, Holocaust denial and uh, misinformation on the web. Um, the Hong Kong Holocaust and Torrent Center, uh, we bring uh, speakers uh, over to Asia from diverse backgrounds, survivors, um, experts on the Holocaust, filmmakers, anti-discrimination activists, and others. Um, and Frank's stepsister, uh, Ms. Eva Slotz, uh, was with us uh, actually in this year's UN Holocaust Memorial Day commemoration in Hong Kong. Um, other speakers in recent years include uh, uh, Mr. Sugihara, um, uh, the son of the uh, Chuani Sugihara, uh, the Righteous Among the Nations, um, a, uh, Ms. Mo Asumang, a German filmmaker. Um, as well as the World War II uh, soldier liberator, Sergeant Rick Carrier. We are primarily active in Hong Kong uh, with programming in mainland China, uh, Taiwan, and Macau. 2020, um, as you all know, as we know, is far from a normal year. Amid COVID-19, we are speaking out against this terrible racism uh, being directed against Chinese people. Um, and other Asians around the world. So right now on the screen, uh, you just see one of the South China, uh, South China Morning Post news article uh, just came out yesterday um, about uh, these discrimination issues that have been haunting the region. And of course, it's not something new. It's not just for 2020, but these are historical problems. Work by organizations uh, around the world like HKHTC is now more important than ever uh, to combating racism and hatred as we continue our programming um, in the region on um, our bilingual, bilingual means Chinese and English, um, educational materials and lectures on the Holocaust, um, the Nanjing massacre, and also the Cambodian genocide. Uh, teacher workshops, uh, we always uh, uh, work with teachers, educators, because we always go to school, but in the meantime, we believe that if we can train teachers 
uh, we uh, communicate with teachers, uh, they are also very, uh, they can be empowered uh, to teach um, genocides uh, around the world and in the region. So we work with teachers very closely. The photo you're looking at now, uh, well, one of the uh, teachers workshop was done in Taiwan, in Hualien. Um, of course, we also do uh, exhibitions, conferences, major remembrance events, and school outreach is our core work. Uh, we are now active in over 70 schools in Hong Kong and uh, Macau. So we work with uh, students very, very closely. And the picture right here, you see um, Holocaust survivor uh, Henry Friedman uh, talk to local uh, Hong Kong students. And in Hong Kong, um, many local schools are wear school uniforms, as you can see from the photos. Um, our goal is to utilize education, uh, awareness, and critical reflection to give students and community members the foundation uh, to advance tolerance and understanding uh, while working to prevent discrimination, prejudice, hate-based crimes of every magnitude. We also collaborate with leading entities around the world on our united front against hate, uh, such as the Anne Frank House, uh, Basing History, uh, the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum. So in this photo right now, um, you will see uh, the students in Shanghai uh, that we work together uh, with them uh, with uh, the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum and also uh, uh, the education uh, uh, department officials right there. Uh, Taiwan's Armour Museum and the National Human Rights Museum in Taiwan, uh, the South Korea-based History NGO Forum for Peace in East Asia. So together, we work here in Asia and combat hatred, uh, racism, and discrimination against all peoples. And we also like to thank together, we remember um, David for co-organizing the 24-hour event and inviting us to participate. In the following hour, you will hear more about the Holocaust experience in Asia, uh, from the Shanghai ghetto uh, to the Asian righteous among the nations, as well as the Nanjing atrocities, and the Cambodian genocide too. And we're going to start with the Asian righteous. Amidst the mass murder of the Jews of Europe in the Second World War, uh, some non-Jewish people um, risked their lives to stand up for humanity and against bar uh, uh, barbarism and hatred. Um, at great personal peril to themselves and their families, they took action to save the lives of some Jews. While some were successful in saving the lives of one or more Jews, others were caught and killed. So in the following uh, uh, moments, uh, let us remember the Asian righteous among the nations. Since the 1950s, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority in Israel, uh, began to bestow the title of Righteous Among the Nations. You can see uh, in the photo now, the Garden of uh, Righteous Among the Nations, um, uh, giving this title uh, upon many brave and noble people who are non-Jews and risk and sometimes lost their lives to save Jews. Six individuals from Asia have been awarded the title of Righteous Among the Nations, and many more helped save Jewish people. And let us remember these courageous people and their brave and selfless acts. Although it took place in Europe, the Holocaust was a global tragedy uh, with ramifications for all humanity. The exemplary actions of these Asian righteous among the nations, uh, one of them right here, uh, you see uh, Ho Fengshan, uh, is the Chinese consul general in, uh, in uh, Vienna during the Second World War in the nationalist Chinese government. Uh, again, they are an inspiration for all, no matter uh, what race, color, or creed. These brave men and women show us that despite apparent differences, we are all human beings and have the choice to do humanitarian acts or be bystanders in the face of danger and personal harm. One of them was Chiyuni Sugihara. Chiyuni Sugihara was a Japanese diplomat who defied the principles not only of his profession, but also of a traditionally ordered and obedient society in order to save thousands of people located a world apart from Japan in Kornos, Lithuania. There, as a vice general, uh, vice consul of Imperial Japan and over a period of less than one month during the summer of 1940, 
He violated his government's instructions and issued over 2,000 transit visas to Jewish refugees, mostly from Poland, enabling an estimated 6,000 Jews to escape the Holocaust. When World War II broke out in September 1939, thousands of Jews fled the German part of Poland to Lithuania, all sought to free Europe for the New World. But because they could not go south or west through the Nazi-occupied areas, the only way out for the refugees was to trans uh, uh, traverse the USSR by Trans-Siberian Railway to the Far East and try to get to the Americas from there. And it was during this period that Sugihara was assigned to open a Japanese consulate in Kaunas at the temporary capital of Lithuania. And in Kaunas, uh, uh, Sugihara served alone as vice consul and also as an intelligence agent reporting on Soviet and German troop movements. With the Soviet annexation of Lithuania in summer 1940, the communist authorities ordered all consulates in Kaunas to be closed. Sugihara had sought a short extension and was among uh, only a handful of foreign diplomats left in Kaunas. And he immediately found himself in, uh, in, in, inundated with uh, pleas from desperate Jewish refugees begging for transit visas to Japan. Thousands of them besieged the consulate day and night, as you can see the photo right here on the left. And when Sugihara sought instructions from Japan, he was told that the applicants must hold a valid visa for a final destination and sufficient funds for the journey. So most had neither of these requirements. And also the Soviet authorities still demanded that all refugees obtain transit visas for Japan in order to ensure that they left the USSR. After consulting with his wife Yukiko, Sugihara reached a difficult decision. By disregarding the instructions of his superiors, he knew he faced possible dismissal and disgrace by his family. However, uh, confronted by the sea of desperate refugees clamoring for visas, his humanitarian instincts won out. He said, I may have to disobey my government, but if I don't, I would be disobeying God. Working sometimes for more than 16 hours, day after day, between July the 31st and August the 28th, 1940, in the period before the consulate closed, he manually filled out some 300 visas a day. And when we talked about this figure, 300 visas a day, that's more than he would normally do in a month. In the photo right here, you see Yukiko, uh, his wife. Yukiko actively assisted him in this task. And even as they boarded the train to leave Kaunas, the Sugiharas were handing out visas and finally even the stamp so that the refugees could just use the stamp to forge these vital documents. Remarkable story. Here you see Sugihara's list, a long list of those people that were uh, 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 say, while, we, uh, while around the world we hear Shrinda's list uh, uh, very often, there's also this Sugihara's list. And overall, Sugihara issued uh, 2,139 visas. And since those holding a visa could bring their families with them, uh, several thousand were able to go. Um, those who could left for Moscow, took the Trans-Siberian Railway to Vladivostok, and from there crossed the streets to Kobe, Japan. And when the refugees began arriving in that port city, they were encouraged to move to Shanghai ghetto. Some of them spent the rest of the war in Shanghai, while others continued to destinations in Western Hemisphere. After the Sugiharas left Kaunas, uh, Sugihara moved on to hold posts in Berlin, uh, Prague, in Romania, etc. And in 1944, Sugihara and his family, uh, he and his uh, three children, uh, he had three children at the time, uh, were arrested by the Soviets in the Romanian capital and interned for three years with diplomats from other enemy countries. In 1985, uh, Sugihara was bestowed the title of the Righteous Among the Nations by Yad Vashem in Israel. He was too ill to travel at the time, uh, but uh, Yukiko, his wife, and one of his sons flew to Jerusalem for the ceremony. 
and it was with great honor that the Hong Kong Holocaust and Torrent Center welcomed Sugi Harris' son Nobuki, uh, as you see in the photo here, and his birth his wife, uh, a few years ago to open our original exhibition on uh, Righteous Among the Nations from Asia, and spoke with local youths in our community. So these are some of the local students uh, right there, uh, which uh, then we had a dialogue together uh, uh, at the University of Hong Kong where this picture was taken among other school campuses. With the following music performance, uh, may we remember the Asian righteous among the nations. Um, Suki Hera and other people like Ho Feng Shan, the Chinese Consul General in Vienna during World War II, will stand out in history as courageous humanitarians for their acts of selflessness. So this piece of music was uh, composed by a Jewish composer who died in a concentration camp. Meeting an actual survivor of the Nanjing massacre brought home the fact that these were all 
recent events beyond the written accounts and grainy black and white photographs and newsreels. Um, several years ago, I met Ai Yi Ying, a survivor of the Nanjing massacre. On a chilling winter day in 1937, um, Ai Ying Ying's uh, father, uh, uncles, and her cousins were taken away from their home by the Japanese soldiers. They were hiding themselves in a cow shed at the time. Six of them were then killed and one severely injured. This is Ai Yi Ying, um, you, as you see on the screen. Um, Ai Yi Ying, together with her two-year-old brother and her almost full-term pregnant mother, escaped by hiding in the mountains to avoid the raping and killing. Shortly after, her mother gave birth to a baby girl, um, but the baby froze to death. When they did receive some food um, from some kind passerby, the mother would always give the food to her two-year-old brother and her. I still remember very uh, vividly when she uh, recollected um, her, um, her survival story uh, back in Nanjing. Uh, she's now um, almost close to age of 90. And her brother would eat the food, uh, but she always shared her food uh, with her mother. She said that there were always dead people around her and she would have nightmares of these dead people, dead bodies. She never forgets the advice from her mother. Her mother told her, Ying, uh, Yi Ying, um, you should not be afraid of the dead people, but should be afraid of the living people looking for girls to rape and boys to kill. Ai Yi Ying, uh, well, we usually call her Ai, uh, Ai Yi in Putonghua, um, she finally found safety when she reached the refugee zone in Qixia district of Nanjing. Twelve people of her family died in the Nanjing massacre. In a research journey three years ago, um, I was lucky to be able to listen to some of the survivors outside Nanjing as well, such as Mr. Gao Xiongfei. Uh, you, you can see on, his, uh, on the photo, um, you saw that uh, he, he lost his right uh, arm. Um, he lost his arm, uh, in fact, so as his beloved mother, uh, during the Yong'an bombing in 1943. While the Nanjing massacre was more widely known, uh, many locals in China, as well as others who study World War II history, rarely heard about the topic um, uh, of this tragic indiscriminate bombing of the Fujian province wartime capital. Throughout its aggression towards China, the Japanese military violated international laws and used aerial bombardment as a key measure to massively kill innocent Chinese people. It launched indiscriminate bombings in more than 900 cities and vast rural areas in China, causing huge losses to the Chinese people's lives and properties. On November the 4th, 1943, Mr. Gao and his mother were having lunch at home when air raid sirens went off, but it was too late to take shelter. A 226 kilogram bomb just exploded just meters away from their home and flying shrapnel sliced off both their right arms. So this is um, Mr. Gao and his uh, mother uh, back then. A neighbor helped them to a hospital where doctors operated for three hours without any uh, anesthetic. And Mr. Gao's earliest childhood memories are of, of blood, bombs, and fire. Mr. Gao has learned more about what happened that day through old newspapers. So he later found out that on that day, 135 bombs were dropped on Yongan and killing more than 500 civilians. And after the war, uh, Mr. Gao um, had tracked down his surgeon to thank him for saving his life. Listening to Mr. Gao's and Miss Ai Yi Ying's, uh, as I called her, Ai Yi, listening to the survival stories always reminded me that we must always remember that to listen to a witness is to become a witness. And on this note, I've talked to Dr. Ron Shirley of Bar Ilan University earlier um, about his argument that when something is not recorded in collective memory, it does not exist. 
So Ron and I will now discuss the significance of collective memory, both of the Holocaust and the Nanjing atrocities. So now I pass the time to Dr. Ron Schley, who will be speaking to us from uh, Israel, in Israel. Um, one important message you spread and you talk to educators at Yad Vashem is about when it's not recorded in collective memory, it does not exist. You always say you cannot emphasize this enough. Why so? Well, we know from our personal experiences in life that even if we suffer and we don't have the words or the terms in which to express and communicate this suffering to others, we tend to question our own memories, question mm. our own experiences. Uh, I always give the example of terms like um, child abuse or sexual right. harassments, which were coined uh, rather lately. And people before they were coined could not actually point to this thing that happened to them and say, okay, something bad has happened, but mm. what is this something? Same thing applies to genocide, which is mm. also a new word, and to uh, Holocaust, which is a new word. And this is why I want to emphasize, as you said, that we need to connect our memories and communicate them to other people in order to be able to remember for our own mm. sake. Mm. That's why it can carry on uh, into generations after generations. This. Uh, or as we always say, never forget. But it's got to be through collective memory. Yeah, it's got to be through collective memory for the future mm. and also for the present. In order for us to understand what has happened, we have to put it in terms that we can understand. Mm. So uh, when we talk about events that happened in China, for instance, uh, the Nanjing massacre mm. or the rape of Nanjing mm. or uh, some uh, revisionist uh, Japanese historians would call it the incident, mm. the China incident. We're talking about a very different uh, terms and which refer to very different concepts of what has happened. And that's why language is utterly important. Uh, it is mm. of uh, the utmost importance, yes. That's right. And, and you just mentioned a bit about uh, World War II in China, as you say, mentioning atrocities. and, and and all the painful memories, particularly, uh, for, of course, when we talked about Unit 731, uh, the biochemical uh, warfare in China during the Second World War. Um, one important bit when we talked about um, war trials, of course, um, uh, perpetrators in the Unit 731 uh, often uh, it, 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 it puzzled people why they escaped a, a proper verdict or, or judgment. And I know you will soon go to China to talk about, uh, in Shanghai, uh, to, talk to, uh, to talk to students, to talk to the public about war criminals, war crime. Uh, can you elaborate more, a little bit more about your upcoming tour? Yes, uh, Jiao Tong University, uh, I'm very thankful to them because they have invited me to talk about massacres of uh, Chinese in Southeast Asia mm. and these massacres like uh, uh, the uh, experiments that were done in China have evaded justice and evaded verdict. So you can uh, look at trials that were done by the British and the Australians mm. in Singapore and uh, in uh, Rabol in, uh, in Papua New Guinea and see that uh, uh, justice was not actually done in the case or in cases where victims were Chinese. The Shanghai Ghetto is a story of Jewish refugees who fled Nazi-occupied Europe and found refuge in Shanghai during World War II. While Jews were denied entry to most countries, Shanghai's open port enabled upwards of 20,000 Jewish refugees to immigrate to the city between 1933 and 1941. Today, uh, we remember their influx to the city, their vibrant cultural life, and later, the increasing restrictions imposed on them by occupying Japanese officials. Isolated and overcrowded in Shanghai's Hong Kau district, Jews faced debilitating conditions, among them starvation, um, disease and psychological duress. By 1938, and with the devastating events of Kristina, the few doors still open for Jewish emigration um, had closed. 
the second Chinese, uh, the second Sino-Japanese War, uh, which began in July 19, 1937, uh, would have unlikely implications for Europe's Jews. The advance of Japanese troops uh, soon led to the Battle of Shanghai, um, a grueling, uh, grueling military campaign that lasted three months. By November, large parts of Shanghai had fallen under Japanese control, including the part of the international settlement referred to as the Hong Kong District. Um, earlier uh, this hour, I've talked about the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum. Uh, in fact, this is where um, the museum is located in the Hong Kong District, uh, which is still um, in Shanghai today. And the city's port uh, remained open until uh, August 1939, enabling Jews to enter without a visa. Soon, tens of thousands of desperate refugees from Germany and Austria arrived in Shanghai after a long voyage by sea. Most had left behind their loved ones and the only country they had ever known. To receive an exit permit, they were forced to forfeit their homes, their businesses, and almost all of their belonging. With the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, uh, the United States declared war on Japan and the war became global in dimension. Japanese troops invaded Shanghai's foreign uh, enclaves and took full control of the city. And this resulted in more restrictions on Shanghai's Jews, who suffered from shortages of food, um, clothing, and medicine, uh, while enduring um, unemployment and isolation. And they knew nothing about the fate of their families. The war also disrupted the flow of funds to Shanghai. So uh, that ended the charitable donations from American organizations that vitally supported um, many of these uh, more destitute uh, refugees. And from this point on, Jews were also subjected to Japanese decrees and among them stricter security measures. Once full-scale war had erupted, the Germans began pressuring their Japanese allies to apply anti-Jewish policies to Shanghai's refugee population. And that all stateless refugees who had arrived in Shanghai after 1937 were to be rounded up and forcibly relocated to a restricted area in the Hong Kong district and would be known among Jews as the Shanghai uh, or Hong Kong ghetto. The Hong Kong ghetto was a drab impoverished area of less than uh, one square mile with a population of approximately 100,000 Chinese and 25,000 Jews. The area was badly damaged in 1937 and had been hastily and poorly reconstructed. Finally, overnight, the population in the ghetto swelled to bursting point, imposing tremendous economic, physical, and above all, psychological burdens on Jewish and Chinese internees. Whole families were squeezed into single rooms. Uh, we're talking about as many as 30 shared a room and often in apartments that lacked modern toilets. And worse, there was no running water and sanitation was dire. Ensuing um, malnutrition and disease uh, brought the total for, uh, mortality figures for 1943 to several hundred. And despite these agonizing circumstances, there were also demonstrations of humanity. While millions of Chinese have been refugees themselves in Shanghai fell to the Japanese, uh, Chinese residents in Hong Kong vacated their own rooms in order to accommodate Jewish refugees. And of course, um, there were uh, uh, very uh, good records uh, in this time from primary historical documents about how there were lots of friendships between uh, Chinese residents and Jewish refugees. Moreover, before, uh, before the ho uh, hospitals for Jewish refugees were operational, uh, Chinese hospitals treated a great number of Jewish refugees and saved many lives. While separated by uh, language and culture, uh, Jews and Chinese found solidarity through shared struggle. And speaking of finding spiritual strength during struggles, um, uh, we cannot miss the topic of music. Uh, uh, before we started, uh, David was asking about uh, pieces of music. And again, uh, every year in our uh, annual commemoration, um, no matter it's Yom HaShoah or the United Nations Holocaust Memorial Day, uh, we greatly use music um, because it's just a, a, a vital piece when, it, when we talked about survival and strength. So now I'm going to speak with musicologist Tamar Mercado at Yafashem 
about the role of music in survival during this tragic period. Here at Yafashan besides me is Jamal. She's a musicologist and also an expert of Holocaust, mu uh, Holocaust music. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Jamal, can I ask, when we talked about Holocaust music, I think one thing that is really um, amazing during the Holocaust was that the Jews kept singing, kept composing. The music never stopped. That's right. That's right. Why Absolutely. was that? This was just um, quite a phenomenon. Why the music never stopped during the Holocaust? Um, I think there are many reasons for that. One of, one of them, of course, is from before the Holocaust. Jews were always making music even before the Holocaust. It was part of their culture. And then during the Holocaust, it was part of a um, uh, kind of escapism, kind of uh, relating themselves to their past. And also about the songs, it was a way of telling the story of being together, of uh, resisting. There were many, many different uh, um, aspects of music during the Holocaust. What types of music are we, were we talking about during the uh, Holocaust? Of course, there are orchestras and choirs and ghettos, mm. and there are songs of the Jews also, also during the Holocaust. I'm talking about the, the music that the Jews made, uh, created by their own will. I'm of not course. talking about the, the music that the Germans obliged them to play. Mm. There's okay. a big difference, of it's course. Com com something completely different. Mm. Uh, if we talked about um, the former, you talked about uh, the music that was made by the Jews during the Holocaust. Was there a, one piece that really struck you? I know there must be a lot. Uh, for, you know, really first of all, one. there is the music of the Theresien Ghetto. Mm. Uh, there, there was really uh, music that was created that is absolutely incredible. But I think that um, I, I, I won't uh, choose the music from the Theresien Ghetto, I would choose something from other places. And uh, specifically I would go uh, from the anonymous Jew who would sing even in camps and in extermination camps when everything seems, seems to be lost and he goes on singing and uh, praying and singing through his prayer. I don't think it's a specific song, but the way, the, the determination to go and sing it. And uh, there are many stories about that, and uh, I think that's fantastic. Thank you, Ayao, for this wonderful 
piece of performance uh, which was filmed at the United Jewish Congregation in Hong Kong. On our Facebook live chat room, I've seen a question from our viewer, Danny. Uh, Danny, you asked how many Jewish refugees were there in Shanghai from 1933 to 1941? Uh, the figure is more than 20,000 uh, Jewish refugees uh, in Shanghai at the time. Uh, by the way, thank you for your question, uh, Danny. I uh, really love this interaction while we're doing live so that um, uh, we can, uh, uh, we, so that we know, first of all, you're watching, but we also know uh, uh, to know uh, you also, uh, for the audience, you, you care about these uh, forgotten um, topics in history. And now uh, to remember the Cambodian genocide, our next speaker is Dr. Emily Tran. She is an academic in European studies at the Hong Kong Baptist University. Emily was born in Phnom Penh on the eve of the, uh, uh, of the Khmer Rouge Revolution, um, whose brutal regime would turn Cambodia into a mass labor camp, resulting into one of the worst genocides of the 20th century. Emily fled uh, Cambodia to France following the Cambodian genocide. Um, so now uh, Emily is now teaching in Hong Kong and lives in Hong Kong. And uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Emily and now pass the time to uh, Dr. Emily Tran of Hong Kong Baptist University. My name is Emily Tran so today and I am a survivor of the Cambodian genocide. Last year, 2019, marked the 40th anniversary of the fall of the Khmer Rouge regime. The Khmer Rouge were insurgents driven by Marxist ideology, and their army was led by a man called Pol Pot. They terrorized Cambodia from 1975 to 1979. In the regime's pursuit of a classless agricultural society, they perpetrated mass killings, primarily targeting the middle class and intellectuals, such as doctors, lawyers, journalists, artists, and students, as well as Chinese Cambodians, ethnic Vietnamese, and Cham Muslims. Part of my family earned their living by practicing Chinese acupuncture and medicine. The other part of my family was in the trade business. My family had all the wrong labels, being both capitalists and intellectuals. Like the other so-called enemies of the regime, we were sent to labor camps, prisons, and killing fields across the country, where in 1.7 to 3 million people died of torture, disease, and starvation. The death toll during that period wiped out to one-fifth of Cambodian's population. As time goes on, Cambodians are steadily overcoming the trauma. Today, Cambodia is a young country with nearly half of its population under the age of 24. Most Cambodians have no direct experience of the conflict. Those who remember it would be in their 50s or older, which means less than 10% of the population. Life expectancy in Cambodia has risen from just 40 year old in the 1980s to 69 year old today. However, outside the country, among the Cambodian diaspora who left their country and migrated to other countries as refugees, there are quite a number of survivors, like my family members and myself. We migrated to France in 1980, like many other Cambodians and Vietnamese boat people. Four decades on, Cambodia is a developing nation of about 16 million people. It is still grappling with its past, not just the genocide, but also the civil war that followed and continued through the early 1990s. From 1979 to 1990, the Khmer Rouge held onto its seat in the United Nations General Assembly and was recognized as the only legitimate representative of Cambodia. When Pol Pot died in 1998, he was only just about to face the possibility of a trial for his unspeakable crimes. Two years ago, in November 2018, a UN tribunal delivered a historic ruling convicting two of the regime's last surviving leaders of the genocide. Nguyen Chua and Pyo Sampan. 
Both were sentenced to life imprisonment. That significant verdict underscored the lingering legacy of the genocidal regime on Cambodian society today. As one of the worst mass killings of the 20th century, the genocide left behind lasting scars. Its legacy still haunts Cambodia in a number of ways. As a matter of fact, many former Khmer Rouge personnel remain in power, including Prime Minister Hun Sen. The government's grip over information has certainly inhibited any open and honest free conversation about what the Khmer Rouge regime was. The government's grip over information has made impossible the achievement of some kind of understanding of what happened. More time will need to pass before the nation can even really begin to come to terms with its history. In the meantime, here I am before you and with you at this unprecedented 24 Global Virtual Vigil. Together, we remember. Let's listen to the voices of those who survived. Kim So, 56 year old in June 2010. In early 1975, the Khmer Rouge slowly started to increase the pressure and on 17 April 1975, many people were forced to leave Phnom Penh to go to camps in different provinces. I could feel that we were not safe, so I decided to leave my position as a monk and went back to my hometown. I saw many horrible things along the way back from Batambang province to my hometown. I saw many dead bodies along the way, the most terrible thing I ever saw in my life. At the same time, I saw Khmer Rouge cadres escorting many people and beating them up. It seemed to me they were forcing people to leave their homes, and I had no idea why they did that. And I even saw that many Khmer Rouge cadres shouted and cheered, but I had no idea why they did that. However, I and other people didn't dare to shout or say anything. But as we did not cheer along with them, then they accused us of being an enemy of their revolution. I was so scared and even thought that they would kill us for sure beyond each of them had a gun. So we just pretended to cheer along with them to save our lives. Then I walked back to my hometown. When I reached my hometown, I realized that all my family members had been separated from each other and been forced to work in different locations. My mother was told to farm while my father worked at the warehouse. My sisters and I worked in a mobile team and the others worked in the children's team. Together, we remember. Let's listen to the voices of those who survived. Ok Sari, 64, in July 2013. We had no time to rest no right to demand anything. But we worked really hard because we wanted to survive and be reunited with our families. Every day we only saw the forest and the mountains. We witnessed the killing and torture of prisoners. Many children became sick and the Khmer Rouge threw them in the air. Many children, men and women were killed and the smell of the corpses was everywhere in the forest. That was the cruel history of the Khmer Rouge. I and other prisoners had to stay there until 1978. After they released us, we could go back to our homes, but unfortunately some lost their lives in the camps. I was later informed about the death of my third older sister, my brother-in-law and my sixth sister as well as three of my nephews in Siem Reap province. The worst news was about the death of my sixth sister. She was killed by the Khmer Rouge. Before she died, she was raped. They cut her vagina, cut her nipples. My mother heard about this 
and cried until she lost consciousness. One month later, I found out that my father had also been killed by the Khmer Rouge. My second oldest brother, as well as my fourth youngest brother and his wife, were all killed in Kampong Cham province. I think about this very often, every day. I still am in pain on the inside and I feel anger towards the Khmer Rouge. I am still wondering why they did such cruel things to their own people. Before they killed my father, how did they torture him? How much pain did he experience when it happened? I lost seven family members during the regime. Only I, my mother, and six brothers and sisters survived the regime. We are still struggling almost every day to live with the pain and fear. My mother and I often have nightmares about our terrifying experiences and my mother still does not dare to talk about it. She prefers to remain silent. She struggles to survive her pains and worries. Together, we remember. Candles are a symbol of life and are a traditional component of remembrance rituals. Candles have a long history as memorial lights. The six candles um, we are lighting in today's event represent the victims murdered during the Holocaust. Here in Hong Kong, these candles are lit in their memory and honor. And each candle has a special dedication. I will now pass the time to Mrs. Afufa Spiola. We are here tonight to remember the victims and the survivors. The six candles we light are in the memory of them. To remember the ghettos, transit camps, and transports, Mr. James Lau Jr. JP, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, will light the first candle. To remember the concentration camps, Rabbi Marta Bergadin, United Jewish Congregation of Hong Kong, will light the second candle. To remember the killing sites, Mufti Muhammad Arshad, Chief Imam of Hong Kong, will light the third candle. To remember the death camps, Mr. Igor Sagitov, Consul General of Russian Federation, will light the fourth candle. To remember the death marches, Ms. Annemieke Royfrock, Consul General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, will light the fifth candle. To remember the other victims, the Roma and Sinti, the mentally and physically handicapped, political prisoners, resistance fighters, homosexuals, and Soviet prisoners of war. Mr. Andrew Jepps, Group Training Development Manager and Senior Training Manager, Cathay Pacific Airways, will light the six candles. For most of our audience, hearing about the Holocaust or meeting a Holocaust survivor is a unique and transformative event. Um, it triggers curiosity to know more about one's own past, as well as about the fragility of civilized societies in the face of discrimination and hatred. Awareness about the suffering of others is crucial circuit breaker to prevent discrimination, violence, and persecution, especially of minorities. 
um, the younger generations of today have a responsibility to remember the atrocities of the past. It is up to all of us to lay the foundations for a world in which genocides become a thing of the past. 20th century Asian history is full of atrocity and suffering, and we recall the mass killings during the Second World War, especially in China, but also in the Philippines and other parts of Southeast Asia. The rape and torment to which women were and still are subject. And genocides in Indonesia, Cambodia, Bangladesh, East Timor, and not least uh, the ongoing suffering of the Rohingya Muslim minority and those living in the unspeakable conditions in North Korea. Each of these needs to be better known and it is incumbent on all of us to strive to raise awareness of these and other atrocities. Knowing about the Holocaust as a critical juncture of human civilization is very important because Holocaust denial is so widespread on the web, uh, main misinformation and dehumanization are the foundations on which intolerance and mass violence grow. Um, during the Second World War, European Jews found soccer in Shanghai and in Manila, and these gestures of warmth and hospitality must also be recalled. And it is our fervent hope that acts of kindness and acceptance of all in need will prevail. Now, events like this helps us to, understand, uh, to, to generate interest in the crimes of the past so as to prevent them in the future. And we are delighted today on April the 30th in the Genocide Awareness Month to be a part of this event. So on behalf of HKHTC, I would like once again to thank Together We Remember uh, David and his team uh, once again for organizing the 24-hour global event and inviting us to participate and also special uh, thanks to Dr. Emily Tran, um, Dr. Ron Shirley, and Tamar Mercado. Uh, thank you for watching um, here in Hong Kong. I just see the clock now, right at 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. right here. And I'm Simon Lee of the Hong Kong Holocaust and Torrance Center, live here in Asia. Together, we remember. Back to you, David. Indeed. Thank you so, so much, Simon. I can't think of a better way uh, to begin our move our intentional move uh, east to west all around the world for our 24-hour global virtual vigil program. Um, this was an incredible program. I've been seeing folks on Facebook and elsewhere really loving the program. So thank you for joining us. Um, oh, I hope you're collaborating soon. I'm going to hold you to that, to your WhatsApp message. I look forward. Maybe I'll come <laughs> over and let it safe. Um, and I hope you get some sleep later on after these 24 hours and your team. <laughs> no sleep between now and then. Uh, but so yeah, thank you so much for having us. All right, thank you, Simon. Now awesome. we have a good have a good day. Uh, thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye.